So good afternoon, everyone uh, joining this uh, webinar today. Uh, before we start uh, the introductions, I will tell you something more about this Zoom session, just that you know that you that you know where you are. We are in an, a webinar setting in Zoom, so only uh, the speakers and the hosts are visible for you. Um, and as an attendee, your video and audio audio is on uh, on muted, so we don't hear you and cannot see you unfortunately but during this uh, webinar you can of course interact uh, with us through the q a uh, 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 button under your screen so please use the q a to uh, ask the questions don't use the chat because uh, we will use that for the uh, uh, yeah, behind the scenes for the uh, organizations and with the q a we can just follow uh, the, the questions that are asked and uh, good to know it's also possible to upvote uh, certain questions uh, also handy to know is that you can adjust your uh, the, the, the the visual presentation by sliding the bar from the left to the right so you can make the presenter bigger or smaller or the uh, presentation bigger or smaller so that's some introductions about Zoom. So for today, uh, I have a co-host. So my name is Jun Hoosmans. I'm from the Department of Pathology at the Amsterdam Medical Center. And I have a co-host today, and that's uh, Rachel Brouwer. And she's assistant professor of the, uh, uh, and works at the Complex Trait Genetics Lab at the VU University. Um, before Rachel will uh, introduce the, uh, the program of today. So the program of today is uh, complex trait genetics. And uh, before uh, Rachel will tell you more about that, I will tell you a small thing about TN2. So TN2 stands for Translational Neuroscience Network. And our aim is to uh, translate or provide a platform for translation between fundamental and clinical neuroscience. Normally, we do that by annual conferences and webinars uh, with alternating topics, primarily focused on neurology, neurology and uh, psychiatry. But last year, we started off this TN2 webinar series focused on the different research programs of uh, Amsterdam Neuroscience. So we already had a couple of uh, different research programs already uh, put it in the in spotlight in, in the last year. Uh, again, today, we will uh, have more um, we have a presentation from the complex trait genetics program. And uh, I think after this uh, uh, session, we still have one uh, program uh, to present, and I will tell you more about it at the end of this session. So let me give you the word and screen to Rachel, and she will tell you more about the research program. Thank you. Um, so today we will have uh, two speakers that are part of the Complex Trade Genetics uh, program. Um, this is a program that is one of the horizontal, so-called horizontal programs, that is not aimed at a specific disease or disorder, um, but rather has a focus on methodology um, and it aims to pre pre provide proof of concept for relationships in, uh, in the brain and ner nervous system mechanisms. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so specifically, the research program explores genetic and epigenetic and environmental causes uh, that are associated to brain function. Uh, and that could mean cognitive, or mental and physical health. And it does so by providing methodology for gene finding and bioinformatics resources. Uh, the team leaders are Frank Jacobs and Daniele Postuma, the latter being the head of the complex trait department at the VU, uh, where both of our speakers from today um, work. So uh, first up is Jeannie Savage. Um, or oh, you, you want to present the program, uh, Jeroen, sorry. Yeah, I can do this very shortly. So we will start with uh, Jeannie Savage and uh, followed by, uh, by Wouter around, Wouter Parot around 12.50. And yeah, we hope to uh, have the yeah close the, the, the meeting at uh, uh, one thirty. So uh, and we hope also have to have a discussion before we do that. So maybe uh, Rachel, yeah, you can introduce. Uh, I think the first yeah. speaker, Jeannie. Yeah. Yeah, Jeannie is first. 
she is a statistical geneticist uh, who did a PhD uh, on alcohol misuse. Uh, she then moved to the complex trait genetics lab. Uh, she has been there for five years now, and she studied genetics of a range of uh, phenotypes. But the last year, she received a Veni grant and got back to her favorite topic, alcohol misuse. Uh, and today she will present some of her findings. So please go ahead, Jeannie. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. Okay, so um, uh, I do have more of a statistical genetics background than a neuroscience background. So I think this topic might be a little bit different than some of the other TN2 webinars thus far, but I hope that you'll find it interesting to learn something about the genetics of alcohol misuse, which is one of the largest contributors both directly and indirectly to the global public health burden. And alcohol misuse is not one single unitary construct, but it actually has multiple dimensions of alcohol misuse or alcohol use behaviors that can be problematic. So from overall heavy consumption to acute hazardous use to what we more commonly think of as the, the, the clinical manifestation of alcohol use disorder, which in itself is actually a constellation of different types of symptoms as well, which are usually all lumped, lumped together into a single clinical diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. And that's also typically what's used in genetics research, um, wh where our most common form of analysis these days is a genome-wide association study, or GWAS, where we look at many millions or uh, tens of millions of individual genetic variants across the genome. And we look to see how each one of those variants is associated with a phenotype of interest, such as an alcohol use disorder diagnosis. This type of analysis results in a plot like what's shown on the slide here. It's called a Manhattan plot, where the position of the genetic variant is shown along the x-axis, and the y-axis shows the log minus log 10 p-value of the association of that genetic variant with the phenotype that's being studied. So we uh, so larger values here mean a stronger association of that variant with the phenotype. So one of the first GWASs of alcohol use disorder consisted of a few thousand cases and controls, so individuals with or without an alcohol use disorder diagnosis. And uh, the, the results from that analysis are shown in the plot here. And we, we use a strong correction for multiple testing because we have millions of variants here in this type of analysis. So the red line at the top of the graph shows the, the, test, the threshold for genome-wide significance after this multiple testing correction. And so in this analysis, the only genome-wide significant association was with a cluster of alcohol dehydrogenase genes that are involved in alcohol metabolism, which were already known risk factors for alcohol use disorder for many decades. So the focus of the field became on increasing, uh, on collecting larger and larger sample sizes of the same phenotype in order to increase statistical power and therefore try to detect variants that have a small level of association with the phenotype that we're interested in. So fast forward a few years and we've collected a sample of over 50,000 individuals with, alcohol, with or without alcohol use disorder. And the only significant finding remains this uh, cluster of alcohol dehydrogenase genes. So we don't really seem to be getting much of anywhere by increasing the sample size. Uh, despite all of the effort that it takes to do so and all of the collaboration that it takes to do so. And I think really the issue with this is that when we're just focusing on something like an alcohol use disorder diagnosis, we're ignoring a whole lot of clinical and epidemiological and twin literature that tells us that there's a lot of heterogeneity within, uh, within measurements like alcohol use disorder diagnoses. So we know from twin research that different symptoms or different clusters of symptoms that are used to, to create an alcohol use disorder diagnosis actually have distinct genetic contributors, different genetic influences on these different symptom clusters. We also know that there are, there's heterogeneity between groups of individuals, um, individuals with alcohol use disorders or with engaging in alcohol misuse. In particular, there's been a longstanding typology uh, that, that classifies drinkers differently that have different etiology between those that have a high level of comorbidity with internalizing disorders like anxiety and depression, and those that have high comorbidity with externalizing disorders like impulse control and antisocial behavior. But much of this heterogeneity is, is, is ignored when we focus simply on unidimensional phenotypes like an alcohol use disorder diagnosis 
or even just a total alcohol consumption. So my research is currently focusing on strategies to incorporate this heterogeneity into our measures and, in, and into our genetic research in order to improve gene identification success, hopefully. And we can do this with a couple of strategies. Um, two of which are looking at heterogeneity within the, the items or the dimensions of the phenotype itself. So looking to see whether different symptoms of alcohol use disorder or, or, or different dimensions of uh, consumption versus problems with alcohol misuse, whether those have different genetic ideologies that's kind of lost when grouping them together, or whether there's different subgroups of individuals that also have a different genetic ideology driving their alcohol, their, their level of alcohol misuse and whether we can identify um, genetically distinct subclusters of individuals if we kind of take that, those differences into account. And that part is particularly relevant for translating genetic research into precision medicine applications and taking those into clinical practice when we look at differences between individuals and uh, targeting the prevention or treatment method, uh, measures to their particular, uh, their particular risk factors. So my research is primarily using the UK Biobank sample, which is a study of a population-based study of about half a million individuals from the UK with detailed measurements, both from self-report and uh, linked medical records, as well as in-person visits to collect DNA for genotyping and to conduct uh, other uh, measurements such as brain imaging for a subset. So the first strategy I applied to the sample was an item level analysis of alcohol misuse with a group of collaborators from the US. And they, uh, together we looked at the alcohol use disorder identification test questionnaire, which is, an, which is collected by self-report in the UK Biobank sample. And this is a common 10 item screening uh, instrument that's used in primarily in primary care settings. And it consists of three items related to consumption of alcohol, and seven items related to alcohol uh, problems or problems with drinking alcohol. And these are typically all summed to create a total audit sum score. But instead of summing these items, we looked at each one of these items individually, conducted a GWAS of each of the individual items, and then used genomic structural equation modeling to see what is to, to conduct a factor, uh, to, 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 to identify the factor structure underlying these individual items which is basically a way of, of seeing which genetic influences are shared between the different items and therefore can be lumped together to improve statistical power versus the genetic influences that are unique to a particular item or set of items, um, which can then benefit by being investigated separately. So the resulting genetic factor structure looked like this, where we found that there was two, cor two correlated genetic factors representing the three consumption items and separately the three, uh, sorry, the seven alcohol problems items from the audit questionnaire. And notably, the first consumption item, which was a measure of how frequently one drinks, had a large genetic residual. So that means genetic influences that were specific to that particular uh, drinking frequency item that were not shared with other measures of consumption. And because this factor structure allows different weightings of the items, that means that not all items contribute equally to the genetic factor as they would if you simply summed the items like is, is typically done in, in clinical practice or in research. We carried those two latent factors forward into their own GWAS, uh, which is shown for the consumption factor in, blue, uh, in, in green at the top and for the problems latent factor in purple at the bottom. And here we were able to find several novel genomic associated loci for the consumption factor, uh, notably, loci that were not significantly associated when we just took a sum score of those three consumption items. There really was a difference when we're appropriately weighting those items. And we also found that the association for the latent consumption factor was enriched uh, primarily in cellular responses to, in, in genes that are associated with cellular responses to alcohol drinking, whereas the association signal in the problems factor was enriched in uh, genes that are related to synaptic transmission. We also looked at genetic correlations between these latent factors and a variety of other phenotypes, which essentially looks to see how, how much of the genetic influences on one trait, one phenotype are shared with other phenotypes. And there's two notable findings here. First is that the uh, problems factor, which is shown in purple, had strong positive genetic correlations with a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders, while the consumptions factor largely did not. 
And second, that the frequency residual, so the unique genetic contributions to the drinking frequency item that were not shared with the, consum the other consumption items, had a strong positive genetic correlation with a number of measures related to socioeconomic status, like income and education level. And that last finding is actually helps help to solve something that was a bit of a paradox in the alcohol genetics field for a while, which is that we saw strong positive genetic correlations between many measures of alcohol misuse and, uh, and higher socioeconomic status or higher income level, which is uh, the opposite of what we would expect from the, from the clinical and epidemiological literature. So when we're able to account for this heterogeneity and uh, appropriately weight these, these different items based on their uh, their shared or unique genetic influences that helps to improve the clinical relevance of the phenotypes that are measured. It also increased our ability to, to discover novel genes related to the consumption dimension. And it tells us something about the different, uh, the different genetic etiologies of the consumption versus problems dimensions, um, which might have something to do with, with, which tells us, first of all, they're important to, to consider as different phenotypes, as different distinct dimensions in clinical practice, and that tells us that they might also have some different underlying um, biological mechanisms that, are, that, that will tell us something more about alcohol misuse in general. So the second analysis is uh, looking, looking at uh, taking a different approach and looking at subgroups of individuals with alcohol misuse. So again, this is using the UK Biobank data, and we looked at a variety of measures that are related to alcohol use and misuse, and internalizing and externalizing psychopathology to try and empirically validate this, uh, this typology of internalizing versus externalizing alcoholics that's been around since the 70s or 80s. So we applied mixture modeling to all of these items, which is a way of grouping together or finding subgroups of individuals in the data based on their similarity to uh, their similarity in the patterns of endorsement of these items or their similarity in prevalence of the different diseases that were disorders that were measured. And then after identifying these latent classes of, of subgroups of individuals, we applied genome-wide association to compare these latent classes to each other to see what, uh, what genetically distinguishes them from each other. So I can't go over all of the results, but just a quick summary is that we found four latent classes uh, that differed primarily quantitatively on their level of alcohol misuse, but also qualitatively on some other some of the other metrics that were included. So the first class is a, a low risk reference class that had generally low levels of alcohol misuse and internalizing and externalizing disorders. A second class of individuals with high levels of internalizing disorders, but generally low or no alcohol use. And then two classes um, of individuals with heavy or relatively high heavy alcohol use but that differed in their level of impairment. So one class that had low levels of alcohol use disorders or clinically diagnosed levels of alcohol use disorders, and uh, as well as low levels of internalizing and externalizing disorders, and then a broad high-risk class that had high endorsement across the array of alcohol uh, internalizing and externalizing disorders. So again, I can't share all of the results now based on time, but just one uh, notable result this is a GWAS comparing the, the classes that were most distinct from each other in terms of alcohol misuse. So the internalizing abstainers versus the broad high risk class four. And we were able to see, uh, we're able to find more than, uh, sorry, able to find 50 significantly associated loci that were associated with membership in, in one class versus the other. About half of which were novel loci that had not been previously associated with other phenotypes of, of alcohol use or misuse, and about a quarter of which were completely novel to both alcohol-related phenotypes and other psychiatric disorders that might be uh, might, might otherwise be indexed by these differences in class membership. So we we found quite a large number of genes that were associated or that were mapped from these two loss findings. So a number of candidate genes that might be useful for follow-up studies, including a couple with uh, functionally interesting variants that are shown on the, result, on the GWAS results here. And on the other hand, when we compared the two heavier drinking classes to each other, class three versus four, we saw no genome-wide significant associations, um, which suggests that there, that there may be some environmental contributors driving who does or does not develop some clinically significant 
problems among those who already drink fairly heavily. So the general results from these GWASs show that, they, that the association signal was enriched in uh, sets of genes that were related, uh, sets of genes that were expected from these types of phenotypes. So uh, tissue specific en enrichment in expression in the, in the cerebellum and in the basal ganglia, as well as in genes related to ethanol metabolism. But there were also some uh, unique results in particular related to this a broad heavy, a broad high risk class four, which uh, in which membership in this class showed a, a, a enrichment of association for genes that are involved in nervous system development, immune signaling, and in genes that were previously associated with a variety of psychiatric disorders. So from this study, we were able to empirically identify subgroups of individuals that differ both qualitatively and quantitatively in their profiles. Um, and because they, they're, these are somewhat overlapping groups, so they're not really quantitatively, or so they're not really categorically distinct internalizing versus externalizing drinkers, for example, it makes the, the biological relevance of the results a bit more challenging to interpret. So it's kind of hard to say what, what is the significance of a gene that, uh, that distinguishes membership in, in one class versus another, but it certainly has led to an increase in the number of novel candidate genes and functional variants that we can identify as being likely candidates for association with alcohol use and misuse, especially as compared to using a, a simple alcohol use disorder diagnosis, as we saw at the beginning. So the, there's certainly, a, even if it's even just a little bit more challenging to interpret, it's certainly giving us a greater potential to move forward the field of alcohol genetics research. So as an overall conclusion to these two projects, we can see that reducing heterogeneity by utilizing more detailed nuanced measurements, instead of just lumping everything together as a single phenotype, this certainly improves our ability to identify associated genes. So it increases our possibility for gene discovery, uh, which is necessary, it's kind of the first necessary step for moving forward functional experiments and translational research. And this isn't just for alcohol use disorders, as I've shown here, but any kind of complex neuropsychiatric trait that most of us are interested in is, uh, is likely to have some degree of heterogeneity, genetic heterogeneity in particular. So I think that all of these, everything in the neuropsychiatric field can benefit from, from having more deep phenotyping. Um, there is somewhat of a trade-off in terms of the simplicity of interpreting the results, possibly loss of statistical power when we're splitting up one large sample into smaller subgroups. Uh, but I think the biggest benefit of this type of research is its potential to provide insight into the biological mechanisms behind specific components of a disease or disorder or into the etiology uh, that might differ uh, of disease or disorder that might differ between individuals, which is something that's kind of the cornerstone for, for developing uh, personalized medicine application and, and developing personalized treatments and prevention that, that are going to be most tailored to individuals level of genetic or, or genetic risk or otherwise. But of course, to do, the, to do this research, the right data needs to be collected. So I hope that you will consider uh, the depth of, and detail of your phenotyping and any future study designs that you might carry out. And if anyone that's listening here has, uh, has this type of in-depth data measured on samples with alcohol measures, as well as uh, genetic information, please feel free to contact me and I hope we can start a collaboration. So lastly, I just want to thank everyone from the Complex Trait Genetics Lab that I work with, as well as the collaborators on these two projects that I've talked about today and uh, the funders for allowing this research to be possible. And with that, I will say uh, thanks and uh, open it up to any questions. Thanks so much, Jeannie. Um, there are uh, some questions uh, in the chat, so um, let's go through them. Um, the first question is, in the GWAS, was sex used as a covariate? And I yeah. think this question is also asking about differences in alcohol use in, uh, between the sexes. So maybe you could elaborate a, bit, elaborate a bit on that for those of us that don't know. Yes, definitely. So uh, sex is, is a huge important determinant of alcohol use and misuse. Um, it's something that's, that's, I guess, illustrates the, 
contextual limitation of alcohol misuse because it's also something that's been changing dramatically over the past uh, decades that if you did research on on alcohol use 50 or 100 years ago you would basically have no women subjects at all um, because it was just not very common for or not any, not anywhere near as common for uh, for females to use alcohol and especially to develop problems with alcohol because there were a lot more behavioral constraints whereas uh, we've seen trends in alcohol use becoming more uh, and alcohol misuse uh, becoming more I guess egalitarian uh, between the sexes in the past few decades so good and, and bad at the same time um, but certainly that's the sex is something that we controlled for for in all of these analyses yes okay thanks um there are also a couple of questions about your subclasses um so i think we'll, we'll do them one by one so uh the first one is which variables um were used to discover these subclasses and why are there four <laughs> basically Okay, so the I went back to the slide that has all of the measures because this is such a short time for presentation. I couldn't really go into all of the details, um, but we had uh, a variety of different measures of alcohol use and misuse. So we had overall consumption, drinking frequency, drinking quantity, binge drinking frequency, um, the same ten items from the the well, so the seven problems items from the audit questionnaire that I talked about in the first half, and disorders uh, diagnoses of alcohol use disorder from medical records, um, as well as a couple questions about change in drinking patterns. So whether people are increasing or, or decreasing their drinking habits um, from internalizing measures, we had measures, so, so we all we have scoured all of the medical records for diagnoses of any anxiety or major depression, as well as externalizing disorders like a tobacco and substance use disorders. And then we had a self-report questionnaire that included some of the personality uh, domains like neuroticism and a recent anxiety and depression symptom score. So those for the GAD7. Um, externalizing measures were a, a bit more limited in terms of what was collected in this sample, but we had um, some self-report measures of uh, behavioral addiction, illicit drug addiction, alcohol addiction, uh, cannabis use, things like that. And as for how we came up with these four classes, that's uh, that's a bit more technical in terms of model fitting. So with with mixture modeling, what we do is fit lots of different models with different numbers of classes. So here we did from two to eight classes, and then there are different measures of the how well that the the model that you've specified actually fits the data that's seen, the, the observed data that you have. And the difference in in the model versus the data gives you a, a measure of model fit, and then you can compare how well one model fits the data versus another model, and uh, that's how we that, that's how we came up with a four class solution being the best model. Okay, thank you. Um, one follow up question is actually already on this slide, um, which is about that there were no different. Uh, no differences between your subclasses three and four um, and you interpreted that uh, in terms of an environment uh, the question is how big were these groups well we can see it here uh, but do you think that sample size has anything to do with it or um, are they really compar comparable in terms of their genetics yeah my first thought as well would be that sample size would be the difference when we're talking about more extreme uh, types of phenotypes. So, so there's there's always going to be fewer people that have an alcohol use disorder diagnosis versus that don't have one, for example. Um, so if you're talking about more extreme phenotypes, sample size is always going to be an issue. But in this case, the, the four classes were relatively evenly split in terms of sample size. So the reason I say that, the reason I would think that uh, environmental influences are more important than genetic influences in this class three versus four comparison is that we don't see any significant uh, genetic signal in the comparison between class three and class four, but we do see significant genetic association signal in all of the other pairwise class comparisons, even though they're, they're relatively the same sample size. So there's 
there are other measurement issues, like just because some of the, the, the items were less frequently endorsed, they're going to have less statistical power behind them. But in terms of just comparing one class to the other, they're, they're roughly equivalent in terms of sample size. So I think we can make some cautious inferences if we, we compare one set of class comparisons to another set of class comparisons. OK. Thanks. Oh, questions. Thanks. Uh, there are more. Um, one is, um, do you feel that these phenotypically distinguished subgroups are genetically homogeneous? Or maybe you could even <laughs> potentially, if you had the data, split it up into more? Yeah. Ooh, that's a really hard question. Um, I. So homogeneity versus heterogeneity is a spectrum. So I, I, the only way you can get absolute genetic homo homogeneity is by having a sample of one person or maybe a pair of identical twins. Um, there are just always going to be some differences between individuals. That's that for, for complex traits, there's just so many genes and genetic variants involved that I don't think they'll ever get down to a perfectly homogeneous group for a non-Mendelian disorder, but um, yeah, it's 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 such a challenge to know where that where the correct dividing line is for that. As as you split into smaller and smaller groups, you can get more homogeneity, more similarity to each other, and get more kind of this is the the one cause or the smaller set of causes for this group versus this group versus this group. But as you as you split up your sample, you're also losing statistical power because just your sample size is, is smaller and there's going to be um, more effects of just random variation in there. So it's, it's always a balancing act between how small do you split up your groups to get these, these, uh, these ideal sized or the ideal balance between noise and signal to improve your gene identification. And I don't know that I have an objective answer to that or that there is an objective answer to that. Um, nice thing about doing things like mixture modeling is that you have these types of uh, tests of model fit that tell you that for a, a four class model is better than a three class model object relatively objectively in terms of the data itself. So that's one kind of guiding principle, but that's a uh, very good question about a very tough subject, which I do not have the answer. I think um, that's part of research, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there is maybe one, well, yeah, it's, it's not really a question, a comment, but uh, can we do that still or shall we move on? Yeah, can I have one, one more question? Yeah. Oh, if it's just one more question, maybe I should choose something else and we'll yeah. send you the rest. Um, this question is about uh, the UKV data. Um, the UK has a specific drinking culture. So how, if at all, might this in influence your results, do you think? Yeah, the, also a good question, also one that's difficult to answer. Um, so there are there's a lot of contextual and environmental influences on alcohol misuse. Uh, I think that studying alcohol misuse in a, a heavier drinking culture like the UK is beneficial for genetic research in the sense that um, what we find in, in gene environment interaction research is that the more constrained your environment is, the more either socially or legally there's restrictions on drinking, the less you have a chance to for, for your genetic predispositions to shine, so to say. So you, they're, they're the less obvious and less uh, possible to detect. So um, I think we can, we're able to detect genetic influences more easily if we look at the UK or the US or cultures that have a, that have a, just a social predisposition for heavier drinking, but uh, the results are very much going to be context dependent. So I wouldn't try to translate these results directly into any other culture that doesn't have similar kinds of drinking patterns. Okay. okay. And with that, let's thank you again and we'll have uh, to move to uh, the next speaker. Um, and the next speaker is uh, Wouter Perrault, um, who is both a psychiatrist and a mathematician.
Um, he uh, did his PhD on topics in statistical genetics with a focus on depression and stref stressful life events. He also got a Veni grant, but today he will, will not talk about that, but on something else, uh, which is how to distinguish psychiatric disorders on a genetic level. Um, please go ahead, Wouter. Hi all, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, well, thanks for the, for the great invitation to be here. I'm excited, uh, excited to be here. Uh, my name is Wouter Perot. I work as a psychiatrist two days a week and I work in statistical genetic research, uh, both at the same lab as Genie and uh, Rachel, the complex trait genetic lab from Daniel Postuma and at the psychiatric department of the Amsterdam UMC location, FUMC. Um, and I'm excited today to present to you uh, two projects that, I'm, that I've been working on, on the genetic differences between psychiatric disorders uh, towards clinical utility. Uh, let me see. All right. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to mention that, that, of course, the genetic research is a very large field uh, with great successes in comparing disorder cases versus healthy controls. Um, and um, uh, I just highlight here a couple of landmark papers in, uh, in nature over the years for schizophrenia and also uh, with great insight, also biological insights and uh, papers in nature genetics. Um, uh, also for bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder. So the success in, in genetic research comparing cases to healthy controls is really enormous over the last couple of years. Um, and um, however, much less research has been conducted into comparing cases across different disorders. And the, uh, the reason for this is when you compare cases of two different disorders, then you need to very carefully uh, match the data across different disorders, which gives technical challenges with respect to matching ancestry and genotyping platform. Uh, but still, I think studying the genetic differences is very relevant because it may improve differential diagnosis and in the long term aim be more uh, disorder specific, um, uh, lead to more disorder specific treatment. Um, and I note I'm sitting in an in a, in a attic room and it's starting, starting to rain. So please, if one of the panelists can uh, interrupt me when you cannot hear me anymore, then I may need to switch to a room on, on the lower floor. And now the thunder is there as well. Okay, when I don't hear anything, I'll just continue uh, uh, talking. Uh, oh, and I forget to mention, but actually I like to be interrupted with a question. So I, I leave it up to the, to the discretion of the, of the moderators if they like to interrupt me, but uh, I like it. So it gives me a feeling I'm not only here speaking through my screen, but actually uh, I'm interacting with a uh, colleague scientist. So the outline of my talk is uh, I'll first uh, look and uh, discuss with you a case-case association testing with a method that we developed CCGWAS, and uh, that is to detect genetic loci for biological follow-up. And uh, then a project that is, so the CCGWAS is already published and finished and on a uh, polygenic prediction model using DDX-PRS, uh, that is to improve differential diagnosis. Um, so if you're interested in any more details, the, pa the paper has been published and you can see the details in the paper. I'll give them a quick overview here. Um, and in the accompanying news and, news and views, they gave this, provided this nice plot. So typical GWAS in genetic research, they compare uh, cases of disorder B to uh, controls and cases of disorder A to controls. And then uh, CCGWAS looks at the uh, at the case case comparison. And CCG was does so by comparing the, uh, uh, the summary statistics or the GWAS results of these comparisons. So that's, that makes it very effective. And CCG was uh, does this by uh, uh, combining two sets of weights of two different components. And the first is the CCG was uh, OLS component. OLS stands for ordinary least square, which refers to the uh, to, the, to minimizing the difference between the anticipated true effects and the estimated true effects in case case. And what it intuitively does, it, we kind of, um, we model the genetic difference between cases and control. So here you can see the uh, cases for, for depression, MDD stands for depression and the controls for depression. Here you can see the uh, cases for schizophrenia and the controls for schizophrenia. And I suppose we're interested to detect, to detect the effects between MDD cases and schizophrenia cases. Then you can intuitively see from this plot that you're much more interested in the schizophrenia case control results than you're interested in MDD case control results. And so this, this is what this first component does. And it optimizes power 
and it controls type one error at uh, non null snips. And then I won't get into much detail here, but CCG was carefully also corrects uh, for false positive uh, association or type one error at, at the stress test snips. And stress test snips are, are kind of tricky to get, um, to get correct because these are snips that have a impact on both disorders, but they don't have an allele frequency difference between uh, the cases. Um, and uh, so CCG was said to be is significant when you reach this, uh, this threshold. And so, and then uh, we developed the method and we validated, validated it with thorough simulation. And then we uh, compared eight psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, ADHD, anorexia nervosa, uh, autism spectrum disorder, OCD, and Tourette syndrome. And um, uh, we found a 313 loci across, uh, loci summed across all of those pairwise comparison. 196 of these were independent loci. And of these loci, 72 were CCG was specific, which, which, with which uh, we mean that they were not significant in the respective input case control GS. And interestingly, we found a, we found, we found an implication of, of the cripple-like factors in schizophrenia, where on the one hand, the cripple-like factors seem to be more important in schizophrenia than in bi bipolar disorder. And it also seemed that another uh, cripple-like factor gene was more important in schizophrenia than in major depressive disorder on the other hand. And interestingly, KLF uh, uh, are, are fall to play a role in neuroid outgrowth and exon regeneration. And, and this fits with the, with the pathogenesis of schizophrenia, which has been hypothesized to really have to do with synaptic pruning during adolescence. And so the conclusions for CCG was, uh, CCG was compares cases of two disorders based on the respective case control GWAS results. Uh, and we identified 196 uh, uh, loci. And the future relevance is that with these loci, and that this really requires a lot of work, but with these loci, uh, we can start to understand the biological differences between different disorders to facilitate more disorder-specific uh, treatment in the future, hopefully. And, and I note, of course, the biological follow-up is not only a challenge for case-case difference, but it's also uh, uh, currently the major focus, I, I think, in genetic research, also for contrasting cases to healthy controls. And, um, uh, uh, and we can be proud of the view that uh, Daniel Postema got the gravitation grant to really look into this and also more internationally, there's the large International Common Disease Alliance, which, uh, uh, which is aimed to get from genetic maps to pathological mechanisms and to uh, develop new medicine. But at the same time, and, and I know not everybody's genetic researcher on the call, there's another focus in genetic research and that is polygenic prediction. And the thing with polygenic prediction is that you can do polygenic prediction, even while you don't know which biological mechanisms underlie the genetic effects that you find. And, and that's why I think that maybe uh, uh, polygenic prediction may become clinically relevant sooner than developing a new medication. I still think the biggest problem of promise of genetics is to get new drugs that, are, that give less side effects and are more effective. Uh, but polygenic prediction is also a candidate to be clinically useful. And how it works, you have a discovery a sample where you estimate the genetic effect sizes of the uh, approximately 1 million uh, uh, genetic variants. Uh, and then you get into a fully independent target sample and you can construct polygenic risk score based on these effect sizes. And then you find that these polygenic risk scores significantly, uh, very significantly predict case control status in the target sample. Um, and this brings me to the second part of my talk, polygenic prediction uh, using uh, uh, DDX-PRS. Um, and just to take you to a clinical vignette, and uh, this is really quite typical in psychiatry that it's very aspecific at the start of a disorder onset. So suppose you have a 20 year old male who visits a psychiatric outpatient clinic. He filled his last two exams, isolates from his friends, is less active and more pessimistic than before. And his girlfriend broke up with him recently. And so what, what is the diagnosis or what may be the diagnosis in 10 years times? So maybe it's a major depressive disorder or recurrent major depressive disorder. Maybe it's a bipolar disorder. It'll be also be manic like a, a, a one year, a one year in the, on the road, or maybe it's a prodromal phase or schizophrenia, or maybe it's a reaction to a life event, uh, quite a heavy reaction to a life event in an otherwise healthy individual. And all of these are possible, but knowing these outcomes like very early in the course of diseases gives great benefit to give disorder specific treatment because the treatment for 
depression is very different from bipolar and schizophrenia. And, and there is a great potential for polygenic prediction with the GWAS sample sizes that are uh, constantly uh, increasing. Um, however, there's no suitable method yet that, uh, 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 that distinguishes different disorders. And most existing methods um, aim to predict case control and not, not probabilities across different disorders. I see that. Wouter, Wout, we have a, question, a live question. Yes, thanks. Uh, Marijn. Oh, well, yeah, that was an accidental live question, I okay. see. Okay. We we'll, might come back to that later. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No worries, no worries. Questions are most welcome. Um, yeah, so mo most, most prediction methods really look at the case control difference uh, and not at probabilities across different disorders. Uh, so that's why we developed our new method, DVX PRS, to distinguish different, dis different psychotic disorders uh, based on polygenic prediction. And so how DDXPRS uh, works, uh, kind of a, in a quick, uh, quick overview. First of all, uh, uh, the input of the method is an individual's genotype. So there's an individual, you have its genotype, you have the genome-wide association studies, summer statistics of schizophrenia, bipolar, and MDD, and you have some clinical prior probability. probability. And throughout the talk, I'll assume we have a clinical prior probability that gives 25% to each of schizophrenia, bipolar, MDD, and to being a healthy control. And then the output of our method DDXPRS is an updated genetically informed disorder probability. So for example, schizophrenia 60, bipolar 20, MDD 10, and control 10. Um, and then, uh, uh, well, we use the GWAS summary statistics to make uh, first case control PRS, and we get some uh, uh, information about the genetic architecture, of which I won't get into detail. And um, uh, so what, C what uh, DDX-PRS does, it first transforms the case control PRS to their respective liability scales, so of schizophrenia, bipolar, and MDD. And then we use uh, uh, certain uh, well-known methods in genetic research uh, uh, to get an expectation of the variance covariance between those polygenic risk scores and the liability scale. Liability scale is, a, is an underlying continuous risk scale that we often use uh, in genetic uh, statistical genetic research to model uh, dichotomous disease traits. So it's a continuous risk scale. And then we combine it to get an updated disorder probability. And so with DDX PRS, uh, we analyze data from the Psychedelic Genomics Consortium. And the Psychedelic Genomics Consortium is a very large international uh, consortium uh, 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 integrating efforts from thousands of researchers across like the full world, like all. All, all continents of the world, at least, maybe not all countries, but all, all continents. Um, and then we use uh, a discovery a GWAS result to construct a polygenic risk score from schizophrenia, bipolar, and de depression based on hundreds of thousands of individuals. And we have an health out sample of almost 12,000 individuals that we use to test the prediction uh, results of DDX PRS. Um, yeah, and what we find is uh, first we find that DDX PRS is well calibrated, and what I mean with well calibrated is that the predicted probability equal the real probability when you look at a subgroup of individuals. Uh, and I note that currently DDX PRS needs a tuning data set, so you have the uh, discovery data set, you have the target data set, and currently DDX PRS needs an additional data set to uh, tune uh, hyperparameters that the model uses. Um, and um, uh, we're currently working uh, uh, to see if DDX PRS can also work without the need of a tuning data set, which I think is very preferable because not every hospital is going to have its own tuning data set, uh, but that's still a uh, uh, still work in progress. Anyway, anyhow, uh, uh, with tuning with tuning data set, DDX PRS is well calibrated, so you predict uh, what is true. Um, and then DDX PRS attains a reasonable uh, area uh, under the curve. Um, and uh, uh, so you can see the schizophrenia first the rest obtains the largest uh, AUC and that, uh, uh, that the average AUC across those uh, comparisons of one class to first the other three is 0.64. And uh, I like the AUC because it's a, yeah, it's a met metric that's often used and it serves our intuition. Uh, but it, I think it's di a difficult measure to assess clinical utility in psychiatry based on the AUC. Uh, so that's why we also look at a metric to go up clinical utility or to get a, to get a sense for the clinical utility. 
and that is the proportion of individuals with a predicted probability larger than 50% for one of those four diagnosis classes. And then again, based on the clinical prior probability of 25% for each of those uh, classes. And so this is an individual that comes into your room and uh, in, in, as a psychiatrist has a 25% chance. And then you do a genetic test say, well, no, the, the chance is 60%. And these may be selected for targeted follow-up. So for example, if you get a prediction for schizophrenia of 60%, then these individuals, even though they may not yet be psychotic when you see them, uh, I think they're really suitable for careful follow-up prevent the psych psychotherapy and to prevent risk factors. So uh, uh, for example, don't use cannabis use, don't use any drugs, uh, be careful to have a regular life. Uh, and, and the aim of this, this is to prevent or postpone the first psychosis and to really minimize the duration of untreated uh, psychosis. And so with the current data, DDXPRS uh, has 16% of individuals that has a predicted probability larger than 50%. So that's a very that's a that's a modest number and um, so then i thought well how, but how does how will it be in the future and uh, so we did a uh, future projections based on the furrow simulation um, and first of all i like to note that the case controlled GWAS sample sizes will continue to increase and they're expected to have doubled by 2025 that's not something that i expect but that has been presented by the head of the pgc professor sullivan uh, uh, at the last uh, uh, World Congress of Psychedelic Genetics. And the larger the discovery G was sample size, the better the predictive uh, power. And furthermore, our uh, simulations have, have a certainty because there are very clear boundaries of projections uh, that are based on a metric that we call the SNP heritability. And based on this uh, simulation, so currently we're, we're uh, our polygenic risk score explain around 40% of the SNP heritability, but when they would explain about 80, 85%, it really starts to reach 30 to 40% uh, uh, of the individuals who have this property that the uh, that, uh, disorder probability increased from 25% to 50% uh, or larger. So uh, I think DDXPRS is expected to provide uh, uh, useful predictions in up to 40% of individuals in five to 10 years time. And they also note that during this five to 10 years times, uh, uh, the effectiveness of DDXPRS can be increased further by including genetic effects of helper traits, which is a common thing in genetic research, for example, neurological or educational attainment, or to include tissue specific computer gene expression based on genetic data, including family history and more. So I think we will be, in five to 10 years, we will be able to do better than this. Um, but still, these are modest numbers. So uh, the question is, is the glass half full or half empty? And you may already know from my tone that I think it's really half full. Um, and um, so for future clinical utility, I think, first of all, it's very important that we really have to have realistic expectation, uh, right? And, 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 and maybe there are some people on the call who suffer psychiatric uh, complaints or anybody, know, everybody knows somebody who has psychiatric complaints and genetic research is not going to be the, 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 the ultimate answer to all problems in psychiatry, right? And it'll never be able to give full prediction certainty will never be possible because the environment is also important. And it will also never be close to uh, uh, an MRI in neurology to diagnose uh, multiple sclerosis, right? So uh, we have to be realistic about the expectation. However, having said that, I'm convinced it's, it, it will be clinically useful. Uh, and I reiterate that the diagnosis is often highly challenging, in particular early on in course when symptoms are really diffuse and that psychiatry currently does not have any objective predictors. And, and I think targeted follow-up and prevention early in course has great potential to reduce the devastating effect of severe psychotic disorder. So if, you, if you're able, somebody from schizophrenia, uh, uh, that, that he will not be sitting, he or her will not be sitting two years being psychotic in its room and being, being afraid before being treated, but you're really able to get much earlier in course, give treatment, uh, you really, I've, I'm convinced you can, can reduce the devastating effects of the psychotic illness. And I also note it, it, so I think it will be useful for a subgroup of patients, but not for all patients, right? So not, not all patients, some patients, it's clear what they have from a clinical perspective. You just see, well, this is schizophrenia, no doubt about it, or bipolar, no doubt about it. But like there, there's a considerable subgroup, uh, which it's just very hard to get a diagnosis, right? And, um, uh, but I also note that challenges remain before clinical uh, uh, implementation. For example, prediction in non-European ancestry, which is really a big issue in genetic research now uh, due to the different sizes of discovery sample size. And of course, 
we still need to carefully research to investigate the clinical benefit in uh, clinical practice. So conclusions for DDX-PRS, uh, uh, it predicts cross-disorder probabilities uh, and challenges remain, but simulations suggest that genetic prediction will have clinical value in the future. Uh, and I thank you all very much. Uh, and this is uh, maybe a bit of an old picture where I did my postdoc with uh, Professor Elkers Price at uh, Harvard School of Public Health, but he's still heavily involved in this project. So uh, the picture is still there, but maybe I should update it at some time. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thanks so much, Wouter. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Um, and the first one is, uh, regarding the case case GOS, uh, you state that the results could inform treatment, but how do you see that work? CC GWAS gives information on differences in allele frequency between uh, uh, case groups. Um, but how do you envision this translates into treatment decisions? And I know part of your answer will probably be PRS, but is there anything is there anything else that we can do? And so so it's so also PRS, but I think. It, it really goes hand in hand with the with the efforts that that are the, the enormous efforts that I mentioned that are into case control comparisons to 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 get the underlying mechanisms and to develop new treatments right and for example when you find uh, uh, also using CCG was result that one one pathway is affected in schizophrenia but not in bipolar disorder and you have some uh, target for this pathway then uh, you can give uh, uh, this this drug specifically to schizophrenia, not to bipolar disorder, right? So it gives you information of the new drugs of, of which mechanisms are important in schizophrenia and in bipolar or MDD, right? And um, uh, I think more specific treatment is really a holy grail, holy grail in psychiatry, because currently, uh, even though there are treatment differences, we also, for example, antipsychotics, we give it to people with schizophrenia, with bipolar disorder, and also to MDD at some point in the, in the, in the treatment trajectories. And it's really like shooting with um, what is it? With hail at a yeah, I don't know, a hagel, hagel spot. Yeah. So, so, so I think th that that that's how I think it can be give more disorder specific treatment. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and then there are a couple of questions, and we're going to combine those, I guess, about your DDX PRS uh, priors. Um, mm. One is, um, what does this prior do? How the, the choice of 25% uh, for each um, might not be realistic in practice. Um, so do you take the prevalence into account? Would it change? Is there, what, what happens if there's way many disorders that people could have? Would you be able to incorporate, well, uh, a much larger number of, of diseases uh, and so yeah. on? Please comment yeah. if you can. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, so I think the, the clinical prior probability is something that the statistical model needs, right? It's just if you have the PRS and the chance for schizophrenia is 10%, then, then even with a large PRS, the chance of schizophrenia is never going to be. 60%, right? Then it increased from 10% to 15%. So the statistical model needs this clinical prior probability to give you uh, well calibrated posterior probabilities. That's first of all. Um, and then how do you get those clinical prior probability? One naive way, which I would not recommend, is indeed looking at your clinical, the clinical setting and looking at the prevalences there. So don't look at the population prevalence, but look at the prevalence at your clinical setting. But much more realistic, I think, is just you have this, this clinical. Uh, you, have, you have your clinical uh, uh, examination, or your, your yeah, your clinical examination of of of, a, of an individual that comes to you as a psychiatrist, and maybe you get this. And of course, this is not statistically uh, rock solid, right? But you have this feeling. Well, I think it's twenty five percent, twenty five percent, fifty, or whatever, right? You have this kind of in clinical intuition, and that's what I would use as a clinical uh, prior probability. And then the genetic data can either confirm this diagnosis or steer it, steer it into the other direction. So that, that's how I would use it. And uh, uh, DDXPRS can be extended to more than, than three or four disorders. Uh, the reason that I focus on schizophrenia, bipolar, MDD is first of all, because these disorders also are challenging in differential diagnosis. Uh, 
uh, but also because just practically the, the current case control GWAS sample sizes are, are largest for these free disorders. Uh, so uh, it's possible when you have uh, powerful discovery GWAS for eight disorders to extend DDXPRS to predict eight disorders. Um, but then again, from a clinical perspective, I think it's I think it's very likely that you have a patient and you think, well, these are the four possibilities and I really have no clue which of four, but I think uh, uh, I've never seen a patient where I think, well, you have eight clinical possibilities and I have no clue which of those eight, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, clear. Yeah. Um, then there is a question. Um, is there evidence that uh, a correct initial diagnosis alleviates the burden of the disease or the effectiveness of treatment? Um, is, is there, are there any studies done into specifically this? Because that, I think the main reason why you try, why you try. No, absolutely. I think that's the complete premises, right? You, you, why, why would you predict if there's nothing you can do or if anything, everything you do has no, uh, has no effect at all, right? So I know from research that like untreated psychosis is very harmful for the brain, right? So when you're able to treat psychosis uh, sooner, it's just uh, better for the brain and for the prognosis. And I know there's also research in the, to, the, to the effects of the duration of untreated psychosis, DUP. Uh, and then you find that the longer the duration of untreated psychosis, that it has unfavorable outcome on the clinical practice. But I, I also uh, uh, acknowledge that this research may not be super thoroughly, right? You're never going to do a randomized trial just to, well, we're going to treat you as soon as possible and we're going to wait with you a little bit, right? So it's all kind of some circumstantial evidence. And I think, but I, I think, uh, so the model, uh, uh, I'm confident it will work and it will give a good uh, prediction accuracies in, in the context that I said, right? It's never going to be 100%, but, but uh, it will be give good, uh, um, a reasonable prediction uh, accuracy. Uh, but like the step to, does it really improve clinical practice? I think that's challenging. That's also research that's required. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm afraid the question, the person asked question is not completely happy with your answer. Okay. Um, and it might be my translation. Yeah. Um, I mean, a different diagnosis, uh, not comparing it to no treatment at all. Okay, so I'm, yeah, so for, for, for um, I don't know. I don't know this research, and I, I and and I'm just going to be bold to say, uh, I, I'm I'm certain uh, uh, that there are no trials to to treat somebody with schizophrenia as MDD and somebody with uh, MDD as schizophrenia just from the very start, right? Uh, and uh, the medic, but I do know from a clinical perspective that you just, uh, even though there's overlap in medication, there's also a strong difference, right? So when you treat somebody with depression, you start first start with one antidepressant, you, you give another antidepressant, then you give yet another antidepressant, then you add lithium, and then maybe you also get an antipsychotic at some point, you know, and whereas with schizophrenia, you start right away with, uh, with giving, giving antipsychotic medication. And it's just a very, yeah, the medication do have different, different effects. Yeah. Okay, I hope this answers, answers better the question. <laughs> I hope so too. I like the webinar, but you never, you cannot, uh, it's difficult to ask, does that answer your question? But uh, still yeah. also in the chat, give a follow-up question. Yeah. Yes, so there is one more question, but uh, maybe you can answer that in the chat later, um, since it is, I think, time to do the general discussion. Sure. Uh, yeah, we can start a uh, uh, more general discussion. Of course, you have time for additional questions. So uh, yeah. I like to introduce Jeannie back. Good, and um, maybe Wouter, you can close your stop sharing your screen. Yeah, yeah sure. So, oh, sorry, uh, I was already looking at the questions. Yes. So uh, yes. maybe I can, if you, unless you have something else to start with. Um, I'm. I kind of also had a question for Wouter that I could maybe combine into a more general discussion which is, uh, my question was how you deal with comorbidity in your models, and so many people don't just come in with one, sig one single diagnosis, and you know, how do you differentiate between one versus the other? And I think that's also something more generally applicable in, in all these kinds of statistical models, like if we're, we're looking at alcohol use disorder in combination with uh, many other disorders that are frequently comorbid with it, how do we, how can we accurately represent what's going on in the clinical data while still trying to pull out what are genetic influences on specific to one disorder versus another. 
Yes, well, I think that's a, that's a great great topic, very interesting. Um, I think there, there are two parts to the answer. You have the, the, the prediction model, so the target sample itself, and you have the discovery set. And when I start with the, with the uh, target sample rate, where you predict, the DDXPRS actually also models comorbidity. And um, uh, uh, so you can also predict the probability that somebody has both schizophrenia and MDD. Uh, for simplicity, I left this out of the slides and the way the, the, the diagnosis currently work is kind of in a, in a hierarch hierarchical way. Uh, well, you, I hope you know what I mean. I don't pronounce very well. Um, and and so, so if somebody has MDD, uh, then we say, well, it's the, uh, MDD, if somebody has both MDD and schizophrenia, it's labeled as schizophrenia. If somebody has MDD and bipolar, well, that's not possible, right? Then it's bipolar. If somebody has MDD, but not bipolar, not schizophrenia, that, that's how we la currently label it. And so that, that's from the target sample. DDXPRS is possible to, to look at comorbidity, to predict comorbidities. For the discovery sample, I, I think, you know, the, the PGC data, even though um, it's, it's a great, great resource and it's great research, uh, the diagnoses are not perfect, right? And maybe 15% of people that are labeled as schizophrenia have, have uh, bipolar, and 50% of bipolar have schizophrenia, and of MDD, some also get schizophrenia, right? So there's just, it's going to be messy data apart from comorbidity. But still, when you look at those big groups and you compare those big groups on average, there's a clear genetic signal that gives this direction, right? So these are still anchors, even though they're not perfect, they're clearly different from each other. We also find a lot of genes that distinguish between those large groups. Uh, so uh, 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 it's not a perfect uh, diagnosed data, but on average, it's very useful data, is what I argue. So I have a question for you both. Um, both of you have approaches where you change from the classical case, case control system to uh, do case case or group group comparisons. Uh, is this the way to go in general? Um, and would that be beneficial for more than just psychiatric phenotypes? Do you think? Uh, I will certainly advocate for it since it's the research that I'm doing. So I, you know, I wouldn't do it if I don't think it's a good idea. But um, but I don't think it's necessarily the only way forward. I think it's kind of a, a complementary approach that, that the, the way the field is going in general is just collecting larger samples of, of the more standard or, or simpler phenotypes. And that's one way to do it, just kind of raw statistical power. Um, so kind of a, a blunt force instrument approach. And that certainly has worked. Uh, to a limited degree in terms of uh, in terms of gene finding or in terms of moving forward our understanding of different neuropsychiatric disorders um but i think once you can only get so much utility out of uh, the, this blunt force instrument so if you're going into more um especially going going into more personalized medicine types of translation i think that we need to have some of this, this more nuanced approaches and really trying to differentiate between between different uh, symptoms or between different disorders uh, to, to try to tailor the understanding of, of the disorder, understanding of a specific person's disorder to, to developing treatment for that or prevention for that. Anything to add, Walter? Um. Yeah, no, no, I really agree. I, I think I think it's really complementary, right? And I, I think the case control uh, research to get into the PEFA mechanisms, it's uh, very important. Uh, it's probably also the major focus still on genetic research, but genetic research has so many great uh, potential, right? To look at the cross case case or look at heterogeneative alcohol use, uh, uh, look at, we didn't discuss to use the causality, look at which tissues are. So there is so much you can do with uh, with genetic research. And, and I think so it's a, uh, it's 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 a very wealthy area, and but I do think for for like clinical utility for so from my my perspective, I think most clinical I think the the quickest route towards clinical utility utility is to trying to distinguish different disorders from each other, because that that's what I'm working on. But that's also what I what I think it's just kind of uh, yeah to finally get the genetic research to the to the clinics. So that's actually so when when you already have um, therapies or drugs in place, so you can 
treat uh, the patients more efficiently. So that's what you mean. But I saw maybe what also popped up in the, in the presentation of Jeannie that also new cluster, new genes or new clusters of genes are discovered. So how do you envision the, the translation to the patients uh, in that case? Do we still need a lot of research once you have identified these genes or clusters of genes? Yeah, I think that's also an opportunity for complementary fields of research where we have these uh, larger, say, biobank type data, but that we just have raw kind of blunt gene discovery power to say these are the kinds of genes or these are the kinds of sets of genes that show enrichment in some association signal. We don't know for which patients that's going to be most informative, but those are kind of the, the broad areas to look in. And then you can take that information into smaller uh, smaller samples that maybe have more neuroimaging or biological uh, measures, uh, and more in-depth or longitudinal uh, samples that would be great if we could get them for a million individuals, but practically and cost-wise, that's you know that's unlikely to happen. Um, so, so being able to take the kind of broad level findings from these big uh, from larger data, uh, blunt force instruments and and apply a more surgical approach to that in smaller samples to get, help refine those findings. Okay. And maybe just slightly related, but um, uh, I mean, finding a gene, it's, 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 you easily underestimate the challenge that this is, right? So you have an associated genetic variant, and then often you have just no idea what gene it belongs, what gene it moderates. You don't know which tissue, what cell type, which, what's, which part of life, which part of the cell type of cycle. So, right, so it's just knowing a gene and then this problem is solved. That's not the way it works, right? So it's kind of, it's really a hard way to get from one gene to the platform mechanisms. How can you change the mechanism? So it's really, uh, yeah, there, and there's brutal force with a lot of people, a lot of money working on it, but it's, you cannot, uh, yeah, you should not underestimate the, the amount of work that this requires and the enormous challenge. And I've, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, the genetic field will, will solve the puzzle, but it's, 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 it's enormous. Yeah, and also the risk that probably genetic variant could be associated with the disease but has no effect. Is that also possible? That there's no um, functional relation with the disease, or that's not what that's not what you hope for, of course. So I think one. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but there's one set of uh, associated SNPs that go via lifestyle, right? So if if, uh, if drug use increases your risk for schizophrenia, and you have a SNP that doesn't necessarily affect on schizophrenia, but it, it affects it, it decreases your risk to use uh, to starting to use drug then then this is kind of it's not showing the path mechanisms of of uh, schizophrenia per se but it's still very useful because then yeah. you can tell people you should really not use drug as well yeah yeah oh yeah that's nice okay Rajo, do you have any closing uh, comments or uh, maybe a final comment that indeed in the genetics field we tend to forget that the environment plays a huge role as well um, and ideally we will be able to combine all of those um, because I think only then we can you know find truly find how things work and how we can prevent people to uh, to get ill uh, but that's um, future stuff I would say okay good I think those are good remarks to uh, and the session, so I, I, I'm hope I'm still hearable, but uh, or you can hear me because I think the thunder that was uh, 15 minutes ago with Wouter is now uh, passing my house. So, um, so that's close. So I want to thank uh, Wouter and Jeannie uh, for your great talks. It was really interesting. We learned a lot. Uh, also, um, want to thank uh, Rajo. I think you were you were a terrific host. Um, great questions and also great questions from the from the audience so thank you for your uh, participation so to close off uh let me start with uh, of course thank you for joining us and uh also this session has been recorded so you can always re-watch it uh via our website there will be an uh, an, an additional uh, webinar coming up uh there's not yet to program a date for that but uh, we hope we can uh, arrange that before the summer so uh, keep uh, keep the websites and uh, twitter and linkedin um, uh, look at it uh, for more information but we also send it around uh, through uh, 
uh, different newsletters. So keep an eye on that. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention and wish you a pleasant afternoon. Thank you very much.